my wife and I decided to put our own home on the market uh, just a few weeks ago because we're empty nesters. Our youngest son got married on Saturday, last Saturday, to a wonderful girl. Our, all, our youngest daughter is getting married in another six weeks. And so we're thinking, okay, what next? What do we do? So we put our house on the market. And that's made me think a lot about your business uh, because I'm a customer, right? And I have to say that our involvement with the stage agents has been almost zero. We have scanned hundreds of properties. We have scanned, actually, over a million different properties. Uh, We've looked inside them. I've driven past the street uh, and all kinds of things. I've been on a journey and all the time thinking, I wonder if I actually need a human being here at all, and if so, why? And what will the role of human beings be in the future? In fact, if we had to start with a blank sheet of paper, What would this industry look like, folks? You see, the reason why I say this, the reason why this is a really serious event, despite the joke, is that in the last 12 months, as you know, the number of your colleagues employed in buying and selling houses in Australia has fallen by 10,000 people in 12 months with 60,000 to 50,000. I'm not the futurist of your business, folks. You are. But my question is this. How many people do you think will be employed in buying and selling houses across Australia within five to ten years. What do you think? If we were going to completely reinvent this industry, if there were no real estate agents in this third millennium, if we had, in this conference, the task of reinventing from scratch how people buy and sell property across Australia in this third millennial age, with all the beginnings, we're in the first gasp, of the third millennium, the first hour of the digital age, the first ten minutes of social networking. If you were to extrapolate forward another ten to fifteen years, what do you think would actually be needed to serve customers well as they want to buy and sell homes? And if there are still human beings involved, what on earth are we doing? And how are we really adding value? You see, my question is this. Some of those 10,000 people may be your friends who lost their jobs in the last 12 months. But I want to know this. Have your customers missed them going? I I mean, they may have missed them in terms of relationship. But in terms of the service, have they missed them? How many more people could we take out of this industry before the customer himself is thinking, I'm not getting the service I need, or there's nobody who understands this market? What does the industry actually need to be in terms of size and capacity and technology to serve the people of Australia well? Am I making myself clear? Because it's only then that we can begin to think what the role of your particular business is within it. So, I want to divide the conversation about the future into six pieces. They spell the word future, F-U-T-U-R-E. The first is fast, and it's to do with the speed of change. And it's the old radar screen. You see, most people think of strategy as the things at the center of the radar, and it's good to be there. But all innovation, all opportunity, all growth tends to happen at the outer edge of the radar screen. So as you complete your own strategic reviews, those sheets of paper on your desk, which you'll be doing at 11 o'clock today, I know that you had those sheets sent to you before the conference began. I'm not going to ask who's already done their homework. Uh, But we are wanting you to think about the center of the radar, your core strategy. But we first have to look at the location of your business in its external environment. And of course, you may have competitors out here, you've got new technologies and other things, but there are also much bigger pictures than that. Issues which we need to consider. We live in a very uncertain time. In fact, some have said that it's a waste of time to try and predict the future at all. Actually, that's really stupid. If that was the case, you couldn't design a mobile phone, you couldn't design a drug, because a drug takes 15 years to develop, 10 years to sell before the patent runs out. So if you are a pharma company, you have to have a 25-year view of the future before you begin. If you're an oil company, you need a 30-year view of the future before you start to drill a well off the coast of Kazakhstan because it will take you that long to get your money back. So 
Of course, every leader has to have a view of the future. You cannot lead without having a vision. But the test of leadership is whether your vision is accurate. And all the time we have to be prepared for the unexpected. Whatever these things are, whatever the business is, whatever the industry, stuff happens. And when it happens, people often say, hey, I was very surprised at that. But actually, a lot of stuff happens in a very unlikely way. But in most businesses, there are many, many, many different things that could happen. All of them unlikely. But when you put all of those different risks together, the chances of stuff happening becomes quite high. I was just talking to uh, our friends from Christchurch in New Zealand where there have been so many shockwaves happening that the earth underneath the houses has turned to a kind of liquid mush and it can never be built on again. Stuff happens. How likely or unlikely did it seem that there would have been an earthquake under all of that real estate uh, even five years ago, the, 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 the risk would have been seen as effectively almost zero by the insurance companies. Stuff happens. So what can we make of all of this uncertainty? S- especially when we, when we look at something as fundamental to your business as the future of interest rates. Well, I'm not going to make a great big speculation about which way things are going to go. I'll only make a couple of general observations, which is this that while our world has been obsessed with inflation over the last five to ten years, the extraordinary thing is that our world, on the whole, has had almost zero inflation. We've been chasing inflation targets in my country of around two or three percent. For over a decade now, I've been saying that I thought that was hazardous. Why? Because stuff happens. When stuff happens... It can affect our multiple, joined-up, globalized world in all kinds of unexpected ways. And when you get combinations of things that happen, they can hit nations very hard and very suddenly. And if, when stuff happens, it knocks 2 or 3% off your inflation rate, then suddenly you're going from growth into recession. Suddenly, you're going from a time where assets are roughly uh, stable or increasing in price to a horrible world where someone's house price is falling in relation to their debt. Someone's offices that they own is falling in relation to the value of the business. and And the whole of the financial mechanisms of our world start to come into question. So deflation is such a ghastly environment for any government to manage, that seemed obvious to me, and it still seems even more obvious now, that to chase an inflation target of only 2% is risky, because you cannot deal with shocks. And so then what happens is you start uh, finding yourself managing on the edge of deflation. And that is why we are seeing around the world official targets and unofficial ones. And in my country, certainly, It's not acknowledged, but the fact of the matter is there's an unofficial inflation target which is now significantly higher. Which is why, in my country, we've been hitting inflation of 3%. They didn't raise interest rates from 0.5. 4%, they didn't raise inflation rates from 0.5. 5%, we still haven't shifted our, our, our interest, sorry, our interest rates have remained steady. Why? Why have they done that? Because they are worried that there are still some big shocks in the system that we are still vulnerable, and the one living nightmare that they have is a deflationary period. So what does that mean for you guys? Well, you can interpret that into your own environment. But I guarantee this, our world is not going to risk deflationary shocks, and there are plenty more of them around. Um, what happens, for example, just in my country, if Greece does get kicked out, of the euro mechanism. What would have happened if Greece had decided not to approve their plan for austerity? And by the way, they have to go on redoing this every three months. And every three months, there are more rats on the streets. What would have happened if Greece had had a catastrophic sudden default on its debt instead of a managed exit from the EU, a eurozone, which is much more likely now? 
The answer is that we would have had all kinds of chaos already in the last few days going through the European markets. Would it matter to Australia? Yes, it might. Our banks in my country have very little exposure to Greek debt, but unfortunately nobody knows where the Greek debt actually lands up. It's just like the Lehman crisis. It could take another year to be sure where that Greek debt is actually held. A lot of it in German banks who are reassured in Hong Kong banks who have securities shared with Chinese banks with ripple implications into Australian banks. We live in an uncertain world, as I say. That is why you will find governments are erring on the side of a slightly higher target for inflation. Combinations of shocks happen more often than you think. Let's look at this. What do you think is the risk of two people in 24 having the same birth date? So we have roughly six on a table, so four tables. Just four tables, and there's a one in 365 chance that you and I share the same birth date, apparently, right? So what's your birth date? 31st of March. Mine is the 15th of January. Now, the chance of two people in 24 having the same birth date, of you and I having the same birth date in this group of 24, is actually 50%. Oh, sorry, sorry, two people within the group is 50%. The chances of two people in 30 having the same birth date, there's a whole page in Wikipedia devoted to the mathematics of this, by the way, is 70%. The chances of two people in 50 having the same birth date is 90%, and the chances of two in, so, in 57 having the same birth date is a staggering 99%. Why? Because actually birth dates relate to each other mathematically. It's a strange thing. As I say, I'm not going to go into the maths of it now, but risks are often complicated because they connect with other things. So that's why coincidences, strange coincidences, happen much more often than you think. What does it mean? It means that as a local estate agent, we need to be thinking about flexibility, about being agile, and above all, we need to understand that the future in general is being driven not by innovation, not by technology, but by one single word. Uh, it's the most important word in the real estate business. <laughs> of course, you know what it is. It's emotion. And there's nothing more emotional than buying and selling property. History has been driven by emotion. Future will be driven by emotion. And if we want to understand the future of the real estate industry, yes, of course, we can look at things like interest rates. But at the end of the day, it's an emotional thing too, to do with mood, confidence and the rest. So which way are these things going to go? Let me give you an example of emotion. Uh, put your hands up if you get frustrated if a web page takes more than 20 seconds to load. Huh? Oh, you're laughing. Now, here's the strange thing. You see, the other day I wanted to buy a new iPad. I've now got it. So there I was on, on the website. Now, it's so slow. I couldn't get on the website. It's so slow. And I thought, I'm jolly well going to get in the car and go and drive there. Actually, that would have taken me an hour and a half. Somehow, it seemed less frustrating. You know what? If your web page takes more than 15 seconds to load, you could lose 60% or 70% of your entire revenue. That's because we've become a very impatient society. Think about it. So 15 to 20 seconds to lose 60% of your business. That is the digital world. So why would I pick up the phone in tomorrow's world and make an appointment to come and see you? When in 15 to 20 seconds you've lost 60 to 70% of your business. I'm telling you history, you tell me tomorrow. In an increasingly impatient world, People want information, they want it at extraordinary speed. Fast urban. Urban is about demographics, fashions and fads, and the urbanization of society. We've seen it in every part of the world. We're seeing it in Australia. But actually, I want to look a bit further afield and think about China and other nations like that, where the most astonishing urbanization is taking place, driven by another of the most important drivers of the future, which is demographics. 
One billion children alive today are affecting, are going to affect the housing market in Australia. How is that? One billion children in the rest of the world will affect your housing market here. Why? Because of these connections. 300 million people will move from rural areas into cities in China alone in the next 9 to 10 years. How will it affect your market? This is how. As they move into cities and as their incomes increase and they become the new emerging middle class, they consume stuff, fortunately from you, from Australia. 20% of all of your exports, as you know, go to supplying this great urbanisation, mega construction and infrastructural dream in China right now. And uh, the Chinese move to cities has only just begun. Look at this. This line here is America's urbanization from 0% to 100%. So you can see that most people in 2011 are now living in cities compared to 1840. And as we go along this line, we see a process uh, of delayed and then accelerating of China. And you can see that where we are today is still only about half the level of urbanization as we see in America. So this story has got a long way to go in China. And uh, as this urbanization continues, we see the price of commodities rising. So that's very good news. Uh, in theory, if you are exporting steel, coal, etc., uh, going north, and 260 million tons of your earth are going out to China. I find it extraordinary that literally square kilometers of your land is being dug up and put in great big huge ships and taken to China where it's cheaper for them to turn it into steel than for you to turn it into steel yourselves in your own land. Extraordinary. 256 billion in Australian commodity exports every single year around 80 billion uh, of trade between you and China, this incredibly important market. But even if China's economy cools down, my friends, there are plenty of other heating up economies to keep your demand going. Because China, as you know, is only actually taking about 20% of your exports right now. Here is another graph I find really interesting. 160,000 new babies born every single year in Australia. Uh, which is uh, a much, uh, your birth rate is, I think, significantly higher than ours in the UK. But what I find interesting, this is 1997 through to 2010, a uh, zero axis. And we've got here in red the uh, building approvals, roughly constant, and in blue the population growth. <laughs> now, this year, this year here, there's a gap. Does anybody know why that is? Yeah, immigration fell and more people decided to disappear from Australia to go and find a better job or something. Uh, so there was a dip. But you can be sure it'll be back. Uh, so what we've got is this, this demographic gap here in terms of housing. And that is a pressure cooker. It's, it's, it's there for the eyes to see. We can debate about what it means for house prices, but it's a physical fact. And we've got another physical fact as well, which is as people live longer, and they live as single people, as people delay getting married, as many marriages split up. We have an increase in the number of households required, which isn't even represented here. So these are uh, healthy fundamentals for the housing market. And uh, at the same time, we could see a change in immigration policy into Australia. Who knows? We may not, depending on uh, which way politics goes. I find this an interesting graph. This uh, here is uh, children, numbers of children. These are male children and adults going up to the age of 85. And on this side, we have female children, uh, 10 to 14, 15 to 19, 20 to 24, going up to 85. There are several things that are really important about this graph. The first is that we have a bulge in the middle. So we have a large number of 20 to 24 to 20 34 year olds who are going to come through the housing process, living at home, are going to, they're going to get tired of living in their shared flats, and they're going to want their own properties. This is an absolute fact. The second is that many of this bulge are going to push up here and they're not going to die like their parents did. We'll come back to that. And they're going to carry on living 
I tell them 84, 94, 104, and they will create their own real estate requirements uh, of different kinds than we've seen in the past. Okay, oh, there's something else too that's very interesting. Is you know the uh, the, the the male famine. Uh, in, if you live, uh, you know this, of course, but I mean, if you're living in Glendon right now, there's a, what is it, a 23 to 1 ratio of women to men? <laughs> That's, mm. uh, if uh, we have 100,000, 100,000 100, more men than women in certain age groups in Australia. Why is that? Because the guys, they go around the world, but they're more likely to fall in love, settle down, and they stay where they are. The women are more likely to come back. We've seen this replicated over and over again over the last few years. It was chronicled big time, as you know, in 2008 and measured by ethnographers. Does it matter? Is it significant? <laughs> yes, it is. It's funny enough. It's all part of the requirements for housing, the patterns, the way that people live, where they live, who they live with. The aging population. 75% of all US and UK wealth is owned by those over the age of 65 and 65% of them are women. Most people over the age of 65 are women uh, and even greater proportion over the age of 85 because men don't live very long. Something to do with our testosterone. Actually, these things have political effects too in Europe uh, actually, and closer to home in places like Japan. And look at this. In Italy, there will be one million people over the age of 90 by 2026. Almost all of them will be women, enough of them to change every election. So every election in Italy will be dominated by the votes of very old women. Does it matter? It's interesting. We are living in a changing world. All kinds of things are changing. Actually, it's a new market. Housing opportunities for 90-year-old women. Can we stop the tick-tock of the clock? Actually, we probably can. There are all kinds of animals which don't seem to get old in the normal way. Uh, you've heard about the, uh, well, things like parrots. They live till they're two, 100 years old. Compared to most of the birds around here who live maybe five years old, no more than that. There's a rockfish project in America which is comparing the genetic code of two kinds of fish, rockfish. Both of them live in the same water. They look identical under the microscope. The only difference is that one of them doesn't have a ticking clock. Scientists so far have been unable to find any mechanism of aging in any of this particular kind of rockfish. And these rockfish will live till they are over 100 years of age and the rest die in 20. It's the same with one particular kind of whale. These whales, most of them are dead by the age of 20 or 25, but some of them are living till they are over 200. And we know that the reason, because they are in the same environment, it has to be in their genes. Could it be that this non-aging whale has the same mechanism inside it that the parrot learnt some centuries ago? A mechanism in common with the rockfish and turtles too? And if it is a gene trick, is it a gene trick that we could teach human beings to learn? What is it that about these animals? I mean, do they live forever? No, they don't. Because they get attacked by fungi, yeasts, bacteria. They get eaten by predators. There are things that happen to them, but they don't go to the doctor for the reasons you do. Most of you in this room who have seen a physician in the last decade have been there because of your birth date. Your birth certificate drove you to the doctor. There is something that is common to people of your age because of the aging process. So we are living at a fascinating stage of scientific research and I'm confident that we will understand much more about the ticking of your clock. But even without that, in Japan, if you're a woman in Japan, every four years, we have to add another 12 whole months to your, expected life, your, your, your life expectancy. And if you're a woman in Australia, in this room right now, we are almost certainly going to have to do the same every four years for almost forever. Why is that? Because of something astonishing that's happening in terms of diet, fitness, health awareness, improvements in cancer treatment, 
uh, uh, improvements in stroke management and other things like that. Does it affect your industry? For sure it does. Because it means that your clients will be older, they'll be making active decisions for longer, and the kinds of housing which they need will require careful thought. Fast urban tribalism. Tribalism is the most powerful force in the world. Tribalism is when, when you have your culture, I have mine. Tribalism is more than uh, differences about uh, Aboriginal tribal groups and languages. Tribalism is about Adelaide versus Brisbane. Tribalism is about West Sydney versus North and East or South. Tribalism is about which football team you support or what kind of trainers or sneakers you buy. Every brand becomes a tribe. Every team is a tribe and every estate agent office for sure is a tribe. Tribalism is your most important weapon against technology. Let me say that again. Tribalism is the most important weapon and defense that your business has against your competitors, including the great internet machine. It's the thought that someone has that they belong to you personally, that they are part of your family, that you housed them last time and you will house them again, that they like the team in your office, they like the way you get on together. There's something nice when they go in there. When they're on the phone, they always feel they're part of the same team that they're talking with. There is something very, very special, which most, almost every successful real estate subconsciously knows from the very beginning, which is all about our relationship. It's about belonging. And the more you can strengthen that feeling of tribalism, the better it will be for you. But the challenge is this, which is the other side of tribalism, which I'll come on to, which is universalism. Because despite all the tribal stuff that you build, the fact is in this mobile world that the next deal they want to do may well be in a different city or a different nation altogether. So we're going to have to go beyond just relying on the old-fashioned tribal relationships to keep ourselves in business. So tribalism, yes, of course, it means seeing the world through the glasses of our customers and offering them excellence and all these other things. But the opposite of tribalism, as I say, is universalism. Globalization, everything everywhere, all the time. This is the world of smartphones. In a number of nations now, most Google searches are starting to be done on mobile phones. Put your hands up if you think that already applies to you. You are doing more search requests on a smartphone in your pocket than in a week than you're doing on a computer in front of you. Put your hands up and have a look around, folks. So we're no longer talking about competition with online search engines on a computer screen. We're talking about competition from a personal advisor called Google, which is sitting in someone's pocket with extraordinary power and capacity to disintermediate what it is that you're trying to do. Now, for my wife and I, when we were looking around, you know, uh, we thought, well, we're empty nurses. We could live anywhere. That doesn't help in a state agent, of course. Because to which state agent do we talk? Which town do we drive to? We had no, not a clue. So we, are, we, are, we, 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 we narrowed it down to a geographic area with a circumference of 150 kilometers. You see, I'm virtual. I can work anywhere. So can my wife. So long as I'm uh, within 100 kilometers of a big airport hub, I'm fine. And then we realize there's more than one. So we then drew in a couple more big circles. So what did we do? Well, actually, it was quite difficult, but it was pointless to talk to an estate agent. So we started to, uh, to search online. And the funny thing is, we d from time to time, we came across something really nice. We thought, oh, wouldn't it be nice to live on the edge of the River Thames? Well, that's no good for an estate agent either. But have you seen the River Thames? It goes like this. <laughs> so we're, so we're now searching through a slice. We're only interested in properties that are 50 meters from the, from the surface of the river. How many estate agents would that be? How many towns, cities, goodness knows what? So then we're, we're actually, we're, we're now we're now floating down the river virtually using, of course, Google. Because we're looking at the uh, satellite maps. Uh, we're able to inspect any property we see. We're looking from the satellite view. We've got the same view as if we were flying by a helicopter right over that property. We can see who's next and the things they've left out of the photograph. And we can see exactly where that railway bridge goes and how close that factory actually is. You can't see from the photographs we can see there. Then we, then we come down from the helicopter. We got out the helicopter virtually. 
Let me start to drive up and down the road, looking to the left and looking to the right, using Google Street View. Actually, we, we decided to drive past a few of these houses. We hadn't actually contacted an estate agent yet, nor had we bothered to make an appointment. Life's too short to make appointments, right? Remember, you lose 60% of your business in 20 seconds. So, we just drove past and we looked to the left, to the right, through Street View, and then I got in the, we got in the car and we actually drove, drove, drove. You know what? We drove 20 miles along the edges of the Thames, looking at the backs of the, and the fronts of these houses that we'd seen from satellite, looking past, oh, that's the one that was on the market. We got out, had a look. There was hardly a single thing that we learnt about any property through actually physically going to stake it out. Now, I'm not saying that we are necessarily are going to do any property transaction independent of an estate agent because we also landed up having a lot of phone conversations. But one thing we've never done is gone in to see an estate agent because life's too short. And why would I bother to have the phone call with the estate agent? I don't need to ask about the average value of the property or what's happening in the property market because every transaction that's happened in that entire neighbourhood is captured by computer and represented graphically. I can cut and slice it in any possible way you want. I don't have to ask what the neighbourhood's like or what the crime rate's there because I've got a map for that too. I don't have to ask what people think about the neighbourhood because the social networks do that for me as well. So you have to begin to think, what is it that I actually want an estate agent to do? And you know what, I'm scratching my head here. But I do want an estate agent to help me before I actually make a really big mistake. I do actually want the assurance of a human being that has been living and eating and breathing property in that area for the last 25 years, who remembers that property. He bought and sold it five years ago, 10 years ago, and 15 years ago, and is up on the market again. He, he knows what the extension is. He knows the other bits they've done to it. And he also knows what's happening to the properties next door. And he knows about the new housing estate that's being planned. And he knows what's happening to the reservoir at the end of the road. This guy knows absolutely everything that there is to know about that local community. Yes, and I would want that reassurance. So I'm not saying there isn't that personal thing. I'm just saying the role needs thinking about. And my question to you over the next three days is, I'm describing history. I'm describing what we did last month. But if we're going to take a 10-year view, if you're going to think about a 30-year-old who's going to buy a first property, who's now 20 years old, what will they be doing using mobile-enabled technology? What will Google be doing in your industry? What will, what will other organisations be doing virtually? And what will the gap be? And how can you fill it? And how can you get yourself positioned there correctly? What will the role... By the way, one of the most important things for me is this. It's fantastic to be able to see on any property that's on the market the floor plan. Because the moment you see the floor plan, the moment I know I don't need to go around it, I can see straight away. The floor plan and the photographs, and by the way, enough of them. You can never have enough photographs. A hundred photographs is not enough of a property. Video is best. So easy to do. Just to go and uh, almost to attach the video camera to your head and walk around it just like a property owner might or uh, uh, someone buying it would. Video has astonishing power to sell houses and is hardly used at all for reasons I cannot, for the life of me, understand. Since it costs nothing to do, you can make it in a few seconds using an iPhone, you can bung it up on YouTube so it costs you nothing whatsoever to host it, and it takes three or four seconds to embed it into your website. Uh, during the night, because it's, I'm uh, time reversed, I'm on UK time, uh, during the night I uploaded 10 or 15 or 20 or 25 video clips, each of which was less than three minutes long, to YouTube. It cost me nothing. I was embedding those, U those video clips all over the place. It's, it's not just low cost, it's zero cost. And it's unbelievably useful. It is often said that one picture is worth a thousand words. If that's the case, then a 60 second video clip is surely worth a million. You can get things across you can never do any other way. Anyway, the point I'm making is that I think we are only in the very first seconds of understanding how digital tools can be used to effectively market property. And then there's the social networking angle. You see, I don't know if you've used TripAdvisor. Put your hands up if you've been on the TripAdvisor site. Okay, interesting. Now, I want you to imagine that you were... Uh, no, this wouldn't be coming here to Fiji, of course. 
imagine you just typed the name of a hotel in where you've been booked to go to a conference, and up comes two, link, uh, two ri- links, the first two on Google. In fact, the only ones you can find on Google, you can't find the hotel anymore because the hotel's disappeared. Why is that? Because Google's policy is to wipe out <laughs> corporate sites so they have to kick back and buy advertising. So they knocked them out of the listings, and there's another reason too, that Google actually thinks that social networks carry more authority than marketing directors. So here are the first two links you have. The first says that the hotel you've selected is the most wonderful hotel in the world. It was the ideal honeymoon, and they had wonderful staff and the rest. The second listing talks about rats running around the bedroom, the fact that your wife nearly died of food poisoning, and the hotel stank and the toilets were blocked. Now, on the right-hand side of the listings was, of course, the official uh, advertisement from the marketing department of the hotel. So you have one click, one first click, which one are you going to go to first? Put your hands up if you're going to go first to the story about the honeymoon. No, there's usually one. No one. Put your hands up first if you're going to go to the cockroaches, rats, and the food poisoning. Okay? Put your hands up first if you're going to go to the official marketing department. Well, okay. Now, here's a strange thing. Who wrote the story about the honeymoon suite? Oh, yeah, the marketing director, that's true. Actually, it wasn't him because he had to get found out by TripAdvisor. So he, he rang his cousin and got his cousin's girlfriend to do it for him and slipped him a $10 bill. So who wrote the story about the rats, cockroaches, and the food poisoning? The competitors. Now, of course, you knew that. I knew it too. And yet, every single time, I will plonk for the story about the rats and the food poisoning. Why? Because the future is not about rational logic. The future is about emotion. And even though I know I'm crazy to even believe a single word up there, I'll go for the emotional story every single time. And the one about disaster strikes me as more emotional than the one about the happy experience. So we live in a strange world where, actually, um, this is a problem that TripAdvisor has. But not too great a problem because most people in the world, just like you, will trust the opinion of a perfect stranger more than they will someone from the company itself. Why does that matter to us? Well, when it comes to selling property, most people in the world will trust the opinion of a perfect stranger about that property or the neighborhood more than an estate agent. Hello? You've just told me that. What you've told me is that nobody trusts official sites anymore. What you told me is that actually, I'm exaggerating to make the point, it's hardly worth putting up the official particulars of the house. If a neighbour was doing it, you'd believe him every time. But if the estate agent is doing it, you can expect it to be a a distorted piece of selling hype. That's what you've told me. Because that's what your attitude is towards the Hilton or any other hotel chain in the world. That's what your attitude is to a pharmaceutical company that's trying to defend its products from criticism in the media. You believe the opinion of a stranger probably, as I will, more than the marketing director or the CEO or the chairman of the company. What it means for us is that one thing's for sure, The future of selling property is going to be a community experience. And the people who are most successful in doing it will not only know their communities like you do inside out, but will be able to represent that community conversation as part of the selling experience in an online world. Fast, urban, tribal, universal, radical. Radical is about single-issue activism and the death of politics. And the most important radical force a worry or concern we have at the moment is about global warming and sustainability. And remember, the future is not about the science of global warming. Uh, you can have your own views on that. The future is about emotion. And the question is, do you think that our society is becoming more or less emotional about issues relating to carbon dioxide and all the rest of it? What do you think? Put your hands up if you think it's less. 
Put your hands up if you think it's more. It's funny, we've gone through a little plateau right now. When recession comes, people stop worrying too much about the ethics. They just want to survive. But it will come back. And it's going to be played out. It has profound implications for real estate. Not just for the kinds of houses which are being built, uh, but the kind of houses people want to live in. And the same is true of prop uh, commercial property too. And for those of you who are managing commercial property, it again is going to be very significant. This is all part of what I have called, uh, in a book called Sustain Agility, the $40 trillion carbon green tech boom. And uh, this is a couple of examples of it, because we can do so many things. In fact, we can probably solve most of the biggest challenges relating to sustainability using today's technology by just scaling up widely what we already have. And an example of that is, uh, is heat pumps. Uh, if we look here, 70% uh, of new buildings in Sweden are using them. 45% of new buildings in New Zealand, as you know. 30% of new buildings in Switzerland and almost 0% in my country. It's strange. We have these technologies which are available. They have a, short, a relatively short payback period. They add capital value to the property because they reduce fuel bills. If you're, in, if you're burning oil in a rural area, it will reduce your fuel bill by at least 50%. With a really nice payback period, uh, you can borrow the money to cover it and so on. Uh, here is another issue which uh, I think is uh, really important. If you look at this building, uh, these buildings here, these are relatively old buildings. In the middle is an even older one. This is from, uh, from, uh, from Melbourne, isn't it? Yeah, sorry, I'm confused. I visit different places, uh, but uh, this I made from Melbourne. And so here we have this structure, which must be, what, 100, 150 years old, something I don't know how old quite old, much older than the properties behind it. Here is a thought, if you're involved in commercial property, as some of you are, you know, in my country, I, I live in a home which is 110 years old. Uh, it was cracked, it needed underpinning, and we have put a concrete raft under it. I hope that building will still stand in 500 years now. There's no reason why it shouldn't. My family owns a, a, an old uh, stone building, uh, which my ancestors built in 1620. Oh, it's still going strong, and uh, there's no reason why it shouldn't still be there in another thousand years. It probably will be. But here's the question. What would your attitude be if you took out a 30-year mortgage on a property which had an auto-destruct button built into it on its 29th birthday? And you knew it was designed from the outset, so the windows start to fall out after 28 years. After 29, the wiring just generally blows up. And after 30, nobody even thinks about repairing it because no one in their right mind thought that any insane idiot would still want to live inside that building or use it in 30 years' time. Welcome to commercial property, my friends. That's the reality of almost every large commercial property that's been built in Australia over the last 40 to 50 years. And some of them haven't lasted 30 years. I think it's a moral issue because 30% of the energy, the lifetime energy of that building is consumed in putting it up and another 10% also pulling it down. And if we could just get that design right in the first place so it became something like the Sydney Opera House that's admired. And can you imagine someone putting an auto-destruct button into the Sydney Opera House design? No way. They'd be put in prison, right? And have the key thrown away. So my own feeling is this is a big issue and it should be part of our whole thinking about commercial property, that we should be building buildings that are beautiful, that will last, that become icons of the past and beacons for the future. Buildings that can be repurposed. Buildings that have vision built into them from the very beginning. Buildings our communities will be proud of and will enrich them as they walk around and remember and celebrate the genius of the people that put those buildings into place and say, I was proud, I remember when that building was built. And they look past when they're 93 and they take their grandchildren there and I'm proud to see that building still there today. So, uh, the concrete industry alone consumes an enormous amount of energy. Five to seven percent of the entire world's carbon dioxide emissions is just making concrete, that's three and a half percent, 
and pouring it out and mixing it with water when it releases a whole load more. And yet you in Australia have done some amazing innovation with all kinds of new concretes which save up to half of all of this carbon dioxide emissions. Our people in Melbourne have been doing this, Zeobond and others. And then we think about green roofs. And, uh, and here's another great thing which makes me smile. This is a sugar company in the UK uh, that decided to make power for its own factory. So they got a big gas pipe, they bought a gas turbine, they make their own power, they generate some heat from that, but they use the power and to power the machinery, they use the heat they, which they collect to cook the sugar, and then someone had a great idea. They thought, why don't we get a whole load of sewage pipes, big pipes, put them on the back of this big gas turbine, and collect this great jet of moist air which is full of carbon dioxide and pump it into somewhere useful, like a greenhouse. And they piped it two and a half kilometers to Europe's leading greenhouse, the largest greenhouse, and one of the largest greenhouses in the world, and inside that greenhouse grow 35 million tomatoes every single year. And the moment they started collecting, connecting the two together, a miracle happened of nature. And we now see 70 million, not 35 million, 70 million tomatoes grown. So 35 million tomatoes, additional tomatoes, are being grown from carbon molecules, from the fuel being used to power a gas turbine, and I think that's cool. And it's what kind of business is British Sugar in? It moved from food manufacturer to generator to heat collection device through to farming of tomatoes. And it's an example of the kind of things you're going to see in real estate in future. All kinds of complex tie-ups where things done on a housing estate are being, are being, are being re-engineered to provide a benefit either to that community or to someone else. One, another example of this, which is hugely important to Australia, is solar energy for obvious reasons. You see, companies like Siemens have discovered that you can, fire, you can now move electricity from the northernmost part of Australia to Sydney itself with almost zero power loss. This was impossible 20 or 30 years ago. This means that in my part of the world, we could power Moscow from the Sahara Desert. With thousands of mirrors, each of them computer controlled, projecting their sunlight onto gas turbines to produce electricity, which is turned into direct current rather than alternating current, which can travel along very high voltage cables for a very long distance. We have the, we have the capacity to power the whole of Australia from an area of desert less than 10 or 15 kilometers by 100 kilometers wide. Extraordinary. Amazing. And something else amazing too. As we find cheaper ways to make power, we also start to solve one of Australia's other fundamental challenges, which is water. Because power means free water if you're close to the sea. It's just a matter of making a lot of it at very low cost. Can we do it? I think we will be able to in years to come, in decades to come. In the meantime, we're seeing the price of solar cells fall by uh, 20% every time you double production. And that's happening every few months right now. And we're seeing, you will see the roofs of every house within 20 years, every new house, clothed with these kinds of things. Car parks covered with them. Hospitals, churches, synagogues, mosques, factories covered in solar cells. Why? Because they've become so cheap, it's the cheapest thing you can possibly do when you're constructing a building. So I find these things exciting, interesting, fascinating, uh, because they offer hope for the future. And of course, they all connect with other things like water. Water management on estates will become uh, uh, much more sophisticated than it is today. Fast, urban, how do you live in this world that's so fast, with people so impatient? How do you live in this world with such huge demographic urban challenges? How do you live in a world that's so tribal that everybody wants to be part of their own group? And it seems sometimes our world is falling to bits. How do you live in a world which is so universal that sometimes we feel we lose our own culture and identity? How do you live in a world which is so radical that small number of, of activists seem to gain huge power 
The answer is we need ethics and values. This is the very soul of our being. It's motivation. It's what causes your staff to get out of bed in the morning and work for you. It's connected with every passion of humankind. And we're back to the beginning of our story with emotion. These ethics and values are the most important thing that we have. And uh, it's the very heart of everything that we sell is being able to look a customer in the eye and know, and they know, that we're doing our very best to serve them in the very best possible way. We're treating them as well as we would if it was our own mother or our brother, uh, that we are on their side. We're just looking to do the most amazing deal that we possibly can to connect some people together who both are in trouble. One needs a property, the other needs to sell and get the deal done quick and at a relatively uh, reasonable cost in terms of the the transaction fees. So what's it about? It's about the only mission statement that makes sense. Every mission statement and every product and service is sold on a promise. Every human motivation comes back to the same thing. Every leader appeals to the same instinct. And what is that? It's the desire to create a better future, create a better world, sort the problem out. Uh, to create a better world for you, for your family, for the community that you live in, for the nation as a whole, for our town, for our city, for our friends, for our colleagues, whoever it is, we sort it out, we make it better, we do what it says on the side of the tin, every single time. And you know what? That's the basis of our reputation, it's the basis of everything that we do. It's satisfied customers every single time who are, at the end of the day, our greatest evangelists, our greatest promoters, especially in the area of social networking. And when it's a stranger in one town who's recommending someone that we hardly know to come and see us in another town because they're also moving into a third town. Why? Because they've seen the passion that you have, the integrity that you shine with, uh, the efficiency and effectiveness and the deep knowledge and insight which drives your business and there's no one else that they'd rather deal with. And that, I believe, will be the heart of the real estate future, a fast, urban, tribal, universal, radical and ethical business, which I hope will continue to be as deeply satisfying for you as it should be for me whenever I engage with you. Thank you very much.